So today's speaker is Ching Yu. Um, she earned her BS in Atmospheric Sciences at the Nanjing University in the fall of 2018, after which point she joined the School of Meteorology in Sims to pursue her master's degree under Greg McFarquhar. Her research is focused on cloud physics and microphysical processes, um, but today she'll be presenting to us about the distributions of condensation, condensation nuclei, cloud condensation nuclei, and cloud properties over the Southern Ocean, and primary results from Marcus. So go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Liz, for the introduction. Thanks all of you for being here with me during the time of self-isolation. Uh, today I'm going to share with you part of the research that I've done during my master years. The topic is about the distribution of condensation nuclei, uh, cloud condensation nuclei, and cloud properties over the Southern Ocean, starting from shipstack identification for Marcus. So hold on one second here before I'm moving on to Marcus. I would thank uh, all of my co-authors, thanks my uh, advisor, Dr. Greg McFarquhar for his encouragement, patience, and in, um, instructions. Thanks Dr. Roder Merchant from the University of Washington, Seattle. He is with us today. Thank you for joining us and uh, thank you for all the cooperations. Um, also, I would like to thank Sai Seiding from Peking University Sai, uh, and uh, Adam Thieden from the Argonne National Lab and Dr. Roy Hemsworth from Australia. So after that, I would give you guys a general picture of my presentation today. I have divided uh, my seminar into eight parts, respectively motivation, campaign background, associated instruments, data screening, uh, pre-data processing, uh, two ship stack cleaning methods, and data cleaning results analysis, and eventually um, a take-home message and future research ahead. Okay, so I'm right now going to walk you through from the first one, which is a uh, motivation. Okay, to start with, let's take a look at the global distribution of absorbed shortwave radiation mean error from the CMIP-5 models, the figure on the right. If you focus on the world ocean, uh, within the five parts, uh, you know, the Indian, the Pacific, Atlantic, and Arctic, and our Southern Ocean, you will definitely pay special attention to the Southern Ocean because of the very large area of red, which means a uh, really, too much shortwave radiation absorbed. In other words, the clouds over the Southern Ocean are poorly represented in those same global climate model simulations. So part of the reason is that almost all the model cloud parameterization have been done and developed using the North Hemisphere data. However, the Southern Ocean clouds are different from its counterpart at the North Hemisphere. So the plan has been made. We make unique observation. We make ob objective observations. We learn the processes that determines aerosol, especially accumulation mode aerosols, uh, cloud condensation nuclei, CCN, and uh, ice nucleating particles, INP properties over the Southern Ocean better. And eventually we are seeking better modeling simulation result. So with this point in our head, I will bring you the markers on board for our discussion. Uh, this figure is showing you the markers. Markers is the abbreviation of measurement of aerosols, radiation, and clouds over the Southern Ocean. This field campaign used the um, Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program's mobile facility, ARM2. Um, it is installed on the shape called Aurora Australis, which is exactly the picture that I showed. Um, the vessel is um, heading for this direction. You know, I'm also showing you um, the monkey deck where displayed lots of our uh, measurement uh, instrumentations here. Okay, so this icebreaker is actually Transversed the Southern Ocean and resupply voyages back and forth from Hobart 
and to Australian Antarctic stations, including Mawson, Davis, Casey, and Macquarie Island as well. So the field campaign is start from October 2017 until the next year, April, because of the South Hemisphere, we are, we are, we are actually uh, seeing the period from spring, summer, and fall. All together, it is 144 days. And here I'm showing you um, a list of instrumentations on board. You know, according to my advisor's suggestions in the first beginning, my analysis of Marcus data is from micro uh, physical perspective, which is more aerosol focused, is more aerosol clouds interactions focused. So associated aerosol instruments are actually set up in an aerosol observing system. Um, I will go with the AOS um, in the following part um, on my seminar. And the left two figures here, I'm showing you respectively the outlook of the AOS and its um, inner setting. Okay, so before I move on to all kinds of instruments that I've been using on in my research, I would like to give you this figure to remind some of our knowledge from our cloud physics class or radiation class. You'd see that in this figure, generally speaking, aerosols are divided into three categories based on their size, diameter, you know, and from, from small scale, uh, which is nucleation mode, and then to uh, accumulation mode aerosol, and then eventually to a large scale, more coarse mode aerosol. I would like you to pay special attention to the units here. This is from 10 nanometer and to one micrometer, and then an um, even louder scale aerosols. You know, each of the aerosols have their different uh, lifetime atmosphere. Um, and uh, with this figure in head, I will be able to present you with all kinds of instruments that I have been using. Okay, the first one I'm going to introduce is CPC, which is condensation particle counter. The condensation particle counter matters the total condensation nuclei concentration for aerosols with a diameter larger than 10 nanometer. So it is actually counting the total particle number collected by the CPC within the, with, with we already have the known uh, volume, we will calculate the concentration. So the CPC is marrying a concentration in units of count per cubic centimeter. Uh, the time resolution for CPC is one count per second, which is the frequency is one hertz. And if you know the CPC well, you will feel easy to understand how the UHICS work. UHICS or UCES is um, ultra high sensitivity aerosol spectrometer, which matters aerosols within the diameters between 60 nanometer to 1000 nanometer. Um, the way it works is the UCES contains altogether 99 bins, each of them each of the bands measuring the particle, uh, measuring a particular a group of um, aerosols that falls in its specific size range, and we counting the total con condensation nuclei number in each bin, and we combine them together to know the distribution function. This is how we know its uh, aerosol number distribution function. It has a, a 10 second per count, so it's a 10 hertz frequency. Okay, so after the two instruments, I will show you this figure again to give you a general picture of what are they measuring. So as you could see here, the UHSAS is only measuring part of the aerosols that has been captured by our CPC. Okay, so another instrument that I'm gonna to introduce to you is called CCN100. It's actually cloud condensation nucleic counter. Cloud condensation nucleic counter is matters uh, the CCN concentration at a supersaturations between 0.1% to 1.0%. To 1 so the CCN is actually the presence of our particles that in the presence of super uh, saturated uh, water vapor activate to become a cloud or a fog droplet later. 
um, because it's not only a function of, you know, it's a function of supersaturation. And so our instrument is cycling through the 0.1%, 0.2%, 0.5%, Zero point eight percent, and eventually one point zero percent supersaturation, and this is a whole circle. And what the instrument has done is it is cycling, you know, um, through each cycle to make sure it is capturing the CCN properties at different supersaturation. Okay, so if we specifically see, we'll look at one supersaturation ratio. Uh, we will have an uh, one hour uh, per count uh, time resolution, which is 3600 hertz. And of course, you know, the, the unit is count per cubic centimeter. All right, besides those uh, aerosol instruments, we also have some other associated instruments, which include the carbon monoxide analyzer, which, uh, which is measuring our uh, carbon monoxide mixing ratio, the unit is a part per million by volume. Uh, we also have our ozone monitor measurement matters in unit of uh, part per billion. We also have other instruments measuring the aerosol characteristics. Uh, I would mention the uh, uh, HTDMA, which is a hygroscopic tangent uh, differential mobility analyzer. Uh, it's measuring the aerosol's hygroscopicity, which is the ability for the aerosol to attract and uh, to hold the water molecules around the surrounding environment. Okay, after all kinds of instruments, we will start on and look at the data. So first of all, is the data screening part. This is a figure with a 15 year record of CN data, which is um, you know, condensation uh, with a function of time. And this is before and after is low passing filtering. You know, the X axis is here is uh, time and the Y axis is showing us the total condensation uh, concentration, which is in units of cubic per centimeter, per, uh, which is in unit of count per cubic centimeter. It's basically between uh, 100 and 1,000 order. Uh, you know, this is a long-term observation which we had from the Cape Grain, which is actually very nearby our um, Hobart. This is Cape Grain, this is Hobart. So similarly, both of them are mirroring the uh, Southern Ocean boundary layer, especially the surface air also. And I will show you the result from our Marcus data. Okay, so this right-hand figure is showing you um, the CPC concentration and the CO mixing ratio time series from our Marcus. The x-axis here, of course, is time series and the y-axis, respectively, from C for CPC is a cubic per centimeter. It's count per cubic centimeter and for CO is ppm wave. You must have noticed this. First, there are a lot of spikes here, not only in the CPC, but also in the CO. Even worse, you must have noticed that the orders here are absolutely different. So for this 15 years time record, we have the 1000 as the largest number, but for our Marcus data, this is like 100 times larger than the previous research and so does the uh, carbon monoxide. So the, here's the thing, it is either that there is a very significant scientific discovery has been found or there is something happened in my data, something went wrong in my data. Considering that there are very consistent um, and, you know, coincident peaks between the CPC concentration and the CO mixing ratio, we would say it is possibly something happening in our data, which is actually a ship stack. So when undertaking the atmospheric um, consumptions and chemistry measurements, the most common local contamination source is often emissions from this power generation. Um, typically, power generations will burn hydrocarbons fuels and it will emit a range of combustion products that are often 
the target species being measured in the background atmosphere. So we are now seeing all kinds of spikes uh, caused by the ship stack. So before we look at the clouds microphysics over the Southern Ocean with our Marcus data, I guess the, the clean data is the first step to go and it is necessary. There is a saying goes, cleaning the data is often the most taxing part of data analysis story, and it is frequently 80% of the work. For me, the data cleaning part is painful. It's really painful, but it's worthwhile. Okay, so before I start into um, dig into the ship stack contamination and identification part, I want to give all of you a general idea and, and intuitive idea of what is going on on board. If we relook at this figure, I'm showing you the location of our observing, uh, ARS observing system, the AOS location. You could, you know, if we change into this picture, we could actually even see the ship stack here. I don't know if the slides is giving you a pretty clear uh, sight, but this is actually the gray plume is actually the ship is releasing its, um, can, it's a ship stack. This is where the icebreaker is heading for. Um, if we look at the, uh, the vessel from a different angle, this is the head of the Aurora Austrias. Um, this is its monkey deck. We have our teammates right here. So this um, silver long tube here is exactly where the ship stack is coming from, from our board. Okay, I will give you a top view of our uh, instruments display on board to let you know where have measurements been taken. So it's showing our locations of chimneys and the location of air rosters. So there are two things here. First, we already noticed that the chimneys are really nearby the air also observing system. The second, the most intuitive uh, idea here is that if the wind is from a specific direction, so if the wind is blowing the exhaust from the chimney directly into our air also observing system, there will be a trouble. It is definitely the, the, the ship stack contamination. So the wind is possibly playing a very important role here when we are analyzing this ship stack issue. So physically, what happened on board, we, we naturally will think that do uh, pigs coincide with specific wind speed or wind direction, wind direction? The thing is, this is not actually a five minutes um, analysis. And because the data that I had by hand is not, the true speed is actually a speed relative to the ship. When I say ship relative speed, I mean, it is relative to the ship speed and the wind direction is relative to the ship's heading rather than the true north. So what I have done in the following part is I uh, began my um, corrections of wind. For time reason, I would just mention a few uh, key points here. Um, I would tell you the data that I used. Okay, so the input data, I use the data from the state navigation system and also the GPS data. Um, I use the course over ground, a speed over ground, and uh, the ship's heading. For meteorology, for meteorology data, I use the meteorology wind, uh, including relative wind speed and wind direction. Uh, this is just a horizontal wind field. And after this, I take the radio sounding data, which is the lowest level radio sounding data, to see if um, my results call incident uh, well or is consistent with the um, radio sunny data to my result. So I will skip the detail part in the corrections and I will directly uh, direct you to uh, the results of the wind um, corrections. So this figure, three of them, we will go through this one by one. The first figure on the top, on the upper top, it is giving us three color. The gray color is the relative wind speed relative to the ship, of course. The blue one is after correction, I derived the true wind speed. And the red one is 
the data from sounding. So this sounding data calculated wind speed. Of course, it's horizontal speed as well. Similarly, I'm giving you the wind directions showing from the relative wind and the true wind and the sounding data. We have been uh, realizing that it is having a pretty consistent trend here between our observations and our calculations. The bottom figure here, I'm showing you the parameters that I've been using our calculation. The, the two, uh, two of the most important one, one of them is the, uh, the speed over ground from the GPS. Another is the heading direction. You may already um, figure out that the shape is really changing a lot of its directions. Okay, so after a very um, detailed picture, we will look at a general picture of our four voyages. So, so for the whole Marcus voyages, all of together, this is a normal distribution of our wind speed and wind direction. Normally, we would have a pretty uh, much western wind, which is represented in orange here. Um, but after the correction, we have been noting that the most, the dominant uh, wind is actually a uh, Eastern wind is uh, more uh, centered in this direction. And so does the, uh, the, the ship's um, velocity. This is uh, the, the blue one is showing you uh, our uh, uh, wind velocity relative to the ship. And the green one is showing you after correction, you know, the center has been shifted um, a little bit and it's centered at 10 meter per second um, from this picture. Okay, so after correction of our wind, we would have a better intuition of what is happening on board. So in this figure, I'm showing you a group of figures from the top one to the bottom one. It's showing you the CPC concentration, the carbon monoxide mixing ratio, the ozone concentra concentration, and the wind interaction. We already have the wind corrected, right? And we also know that if I divide the wind into two um, separate components, one is in the ship's direction, another one is vertically, um, vertically to the wind, uh, the, the, the ship's heading, then the wind in direction refers to what has been um, blowed on our, on our heading direction. So I think this is more important in our analysis and, and I separately um, plot it in our bottom line here. So the two different color here, the orange one and the pink one, the orange one and the pink one in the four figure are showing our contamination period, which is saying that the shape stack is substantially in fact our observation. The black one and the blue one in four figures are showing you the results after ship stack contamination. So you will notice that, um, first of all, the CPC is the most sensitive one. Apparently, it is much higher frequency changed. And then the contamination happens when the wind, um, when the wind in uh, AA's heading direction is pretty small, so it's nearby zero when the contamination is happening. Um, also, when the CO is dramatically increasing, it has a same time um, ozone decreasing. And there are also a few uh, signals here, which I do not show the figure for you because from our camera information, the precipitation is infecting our contamination as well. And all of this above, we're seeing that a local recirculation near our board is probably a reason for our contamination. Okay, so after that intuitive general picture, I will show you the previous research have been done for data cleaning part in the ship stack. We have seen they use the wind direction, wind speed already, right? They also use the rapid change in aerosol concentration, um, which we later will use a machine learning classifier based on those principles. They also use the extreme values of pollutant gases um, and also uh, CO2 as well. And we will base on this to have our 
a method for markers, which is called median of the absolute deviation, MAD. They also have increasing of diameter in dominant particle mode as a signal, and they uh, identify the black uh, carbon and the VOCs, aerosols concentrations as well. Some of, of them even use a chemine clustering as a method. So based on the previous method, we will use um, two of them in our Marcus data analysis. The first one is MAD, and of course, the later one is a machine learning classifier. Okay, so before every um, method could be implemented in our data, um, a few pre-data processing must have been done. The first step for our pre-data processing, it's about the ARM QC. So the ARM Data Quality Control Office is giving us a list of QC flag, eliminating the time period where the instruments are not working well. Um, for example, I will give you the example of increasing values of CPC issues here. So in this figure, the upper right side of our figure is showing you the CPC concentration time series. Those are the spikes that happen during our measurement. And the right one here I'm showing you, some of them is because the CPC condensation is the negative value and the QC flex is showing you it is below our valid median value. So they are giving us a warning that it is not a good measurement. Different uh, measurements, different institute instruments have different QC. For the carbon monoxide, you know, it has a every 24 hour calibration time period. So every 24 hours, basically every midnight, we will have a pretty high carbon monoxide mixing ratio, but it's not the normal um, measurement mode. So we will not use those very tiny peaks here as well. The same thing, you know, for different instruments, we are only passing the data, which is not only, you know, it's, it's in good data shape, but it's okay if it's really pretty huge, pretty large extreme, but I need the instruments to be in a pretty good condition to take measurements. It's like what we have been doing in our security check, right? We let the, uh, the good data pass through, but we do not want the pretty high values, extreme and outliers value to be stopped outside of our game. As I said, different instruments have a different QC flag. This is a specifically QC for CCN. Here I have CCN concentration plotted on the vertical axis as a function of time on the horizontal axis. With time increasing, we are going to increase supersaturations as the CCN circles between different saturations. But you see, with the red circles here, when I go from a 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 supersaturation, there is a decrease in the concentration that is not physical. So their polynomial fit is given to this curve. And, you know, if we have this deflection point, this is an indication that it is not a good measurement. Um, and those data is not, will be, is not used for us. So on the right hand side, however, we are showing what is expected. Namely, when we increase the supersaturation, there is a continued increase in CCN, and there is a different polynomial fit, and therefore, these are good data. So, this is a, a QC bit for CCN. We also have some data which does not really have a quite good uh, QC flag. Say, for example, the UHSAS data, we are using the UCS data to calculate the accumulation mode aerosol. But we don't have a pretty good QC flag here, so I compare the CCN data and the UHSAS data. In this figure, X axis, I'm showing you the time, of course, and the Y axis is concentration in unit of account per cubic centimeter. I'm showing you a different supersaturation ratio respectively from yellow to green to red. It is, it is showing you 0 0.1, 0.2, 0.5% supersaturation um, for our CCM measurement. 
and for the accumulation mode error also I am showing you in blue. For those measurements in my right circle, as you have noticed that the accumulation mode error also is not consistent to the CCN measurement, which is possibly because this are missing data, but because we do not have a pretty good flag saying it is missing data, we just give a 0, 0.0 value here, and this is not a good data for us to use. So we'll manually set those data into uh, not good data and not use them. After all kinds of QC, the next step for me is to handling the missing data. So basically, if the data is, you know, without a CPC value, we will use that as a suspicious data. And we then do a comparison um, to see the overlap between different instruments. The figure at the bottom is a time series for a CPC concentra concentration and the UCS data for aerosol concentration. We, we know that the UCS data is part of the CPC measurements, so any of the uh, area where the orange one is higher than the blue one, it, there must be an issue there because it will not be in this physically makes sense way. So after all those uh, pre-data analysis part, we will go for our method for markets. The first one is a median of absolute deviation. It's mainly applied to the trace gas concentration outlier. It also uses the condensation outlier number as well. Another one is machine learning classification. We mainly used um, this one to uh, dramatically increase in condensation number. Uh, I don't expect you to know the details of MAD. What we need to know here is that we separately identify the CO and the CN's outliers, and then we combine them with the buffer to sum the number of exhausted points in the window because the CO and CN have different frequency and changes, and they have different lifetime as well. For machine learning classification, um, here is a plot of our CN concentration with time. See. There are fairly low concentrations, about 500 per uh, cubic centimeter at the majority of this times. So, however, you can also see a spike here in the data near November 11th, one o'clock. If we zoom in, we would notice that to give you a simplest way to understand this method, for example, the spike will manually be identified as outline data. And using random forest classification and some you know, machine learning techniques, we are basically teaching the model, this is the pattern you need to learn. And we trained the agent to do the classification for us for the following data. This is showing the machine learning classification algorithm result. So the yellow and blue are showing you the CPC data and you could see the blue areas are identified as contaminated by the machine learning algorithm because there are big sp spikes and big changes, whereas the yellow data are okay. Uh, we could also see the same type of contamination has been marked down for the UCS data as well with green and blue respectively. Um, the machine learning classifier successfully picks up the spikes in, t in both total condensation number from CPC and the accumulation mode error also con concentration from the UCS. And we will start from the five day period to a general picture, which is showing you the result from our MAD method of our Hobart to McCoy Island voyage. So in this voyage, we could see the Pink color has been identified as a ship stack contamination by the MAD, and the, the blue one is what has been uh, recognized as a good data, which is a non ship stack data. And respectively, from yellow to green to red, we are seeing different supersaturation CCN results here. Apparently, the MAD successfully picked up the peaks in total concentration. Con concentration. We also have noticed that whatever uh, for the Hobart to McCoy Island or from Hobart to Davis, there are a limited number of accumulation mode clean has been left and there is even less CCN data has been left. And uh, just for the different super saturation ratio, apparently the 0.5% super saturation high the, has the best quality um, after the an, an identification. 
So after uh, separately reduce the two methods, we will need to combine them to see um, the comparisons between the two uh, results. This is the most complicated figure in my uh, presentation, and I will walk through this little by little. So the four color here, the green color is showing you both the MAD and machine learning classification think it is bad data. The yellow one is showing you only machine learning think it is bad data. And the MAD is showing you that the blue one is showing you only MAD is thinking it's a bad data. We notice that with MAD has an additional input the carbon monoxide, it is showing a more conservative good ratio. It has 59% um, um, shape stack data, um, and the machine learning only have the 51%. So another thing, you know, neither MAD nor um, MI data has been in a gray, which is only 38% uh, data has been left. The MAD method is intensively statistics-based so it's more sensitive to extreme value. If you see the very tiny specks here, it's just in blue but not in yellow. It's because the MAD is really, really good at um, examining the extreme values, while the machine learning classifier is better at recognized patterns and it's more sensitive to changes. And also those um, yellow um, ranges because the rolling window size in the machine learning classifier do affect good data ratio as well. Okay, so here I'm showing you the aerosol characteristic from a fine scale, which is saying is high groscopicity. We will pick up two periods. One is extremely bad um, contaminated. Another one is a relative clean one. It's a relative pristine environment. So the four, four figures here, uh, vertically, it is showing you the same time period. Uh, horizontally, it is showing you the figure from the same instrument. So the first row here is from our UCS. The second row is from the HTDMA, which is Mary's hygroscopicity. Um, we could see in this relative pristine uh, time, it is in this um, size distribution, and the actually the ship stack contributes the aerosols with very high. Uh, hydroscopicity. Well, the, this column after comparison between those, we will know that the, the background uh, distribution of air also on our boundary layer southern ocean surface. Okay, so to put the uh, contamination together with the relative pristine um, time, we will have this figure. It's showing the size distribution from UCES. It's a time series as well. Uh, if we uh, plot the size distribution in a log scale, we would notice that from this figure to see the ship stack contributes a broad size range of aerosols, but mostly diameter is smaller than 0 0.2 micrometer. Okay, I will show you guys the take home message here. First of all, Marcus aerosol observing system was substantially contaminated by the ship stack. Then we use the MAD and machine learning classifier to identify the ship stack contaminated aerosol data. As you have been noticing, both of them have done a good job in picking up the outliers values in both the CPC and the CCN. The machine learning classifier is picking up around 51% and the IMAD is nearby 60% of that. As for the CCN data, we are using, um, we are seeing around 75% to 92% contamination depending on different void. With the remaining data left, we will examine the correlation between accumulation mode aerosol and the cloud properties and different meteorological environments. Not, last but not the least, I want to acknowledge the UI's Department of Energy who support my research and also those institutions which give me very supportive uh, information in my research. I would also um, would like to uh, let you guys ask for any corrections or questions or comments, please uh, jump in and thanks you guys for listening very much. Thank you again. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead um, and give everybody the option to unmute themselves. 
And um, yeah, go ahead and hop in and ask questions. All right, well, while we're waiting maybe for some others to figure out how to unmute themselves, um, I have a quick question for you. So you were able to show that um, across these distributions, um, a lot of times when you had these really, really strong signals or these tall peaks um, in the concentrations or the counts, and that was when the contamination period was. Um, is there any way that, that was a lot of your period, actually, a lot of your period was contaminated. Is there any way to get information about what the background might be to still have some information about what the counts are during those contaminated periods? Uh, are you saying that uh, for those count, uh, like contamination periods, could we also see some uh, background information? Mm -hmm. uh, I think our plan is to, first of all, remove the contamination first. And then we will use the left data as a background uh, aerosol um, information. Okay. As for how many information could have been derived from the contamination period, it is seeing um, like, like what is that? Um, like what kind of information are you in your mind um, do you want to use with the contamination period? Okay, so it is possible to get some information, you just don't know exactly what information can be gained from those periods? It's, right now it's not 100% bad data, but it's uh, not good data, so I'm not using it, but I will think about it if we could use those data because they are really a large number of data. Exactly. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? So what percentage of data did you use to train your machine learning model? Oh, that uh, ratio is, um, cause I, let me think the data there. It is less than 10% manually labeled data. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. All right, any more questions for our speaker today? All right, well, I think that wraps up today's session. So thanks for giving a great talk and thanks for everybody chiming in. Um, try to get outside and enjoy some of our nice weather today. It is pretty nice. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.